Today is January 24th, 2014. I'm Kevin Savitz talking to Dennis Harkins, who was the author of the APX program, uh, message display program, and also did other interesting things. Uh, I am interviewing him over Skype from my house in Portland, Oregon, and Dennis is where? Uh, in Aiken, South Carolina. Excellent. Okay, Dennis, um, where do you want to start? How, how did you get started with uh, the, the Atari? 8-bit machines. It's, it's a funny story. It's a little different. I was working with television in, in the schools. I was a school teacher mm -hmm. and had always been a bit of an electronics buff. Uh, I had taught film classes and things like that and uh, television came in and you know in the early days of educational technology I was a new teacher and uh, we got a federal grant for a technology in the schools which at the time was television so you see a lot of schools got these big television studios and they asked me would I take this on would I teach a class in TV production so I did and I found that one item we needed really badly was a character generator and the darn things were five thousand dollars so uh, I was a hobbyist at the time and saw the Atari had wonderful color graphics for a, a home computer that had just been introduced. I saw it at a computer show, I guess, and uh, I was fascinated and I saw that it had an RF output I could change into something and use it to do titles. So I was pr primarily interested in doing titles, just using it as a character generator because the Atari was, I think, for schools at the time. I bought an 800 myself with my own money for about, uh, oh, I guess it was $1,300. So I was up and running and I learned to program by the seat of my pants, plugged it into our television set, uh, and uh, sat on a little typing table and programmed away and joined the Philadelphia Area Computer Society to get some help learning to program and, and seeing if this made sense, what I wanted to do with it. Well, it worked out, and it turned into uh, uh, writing a program. Uh, it was called Message Display Program, and we used it for cable access. So our high school was given by a cable company a channel to uh, broadcast information and do programs. And a character generator would display messages, community information. So I wrote a program so that the Atari could simply display pages up to about 40 or 50 pages of just messages but it was great it was community information and it was exactly what the community needed and I could train one of my students to actually enter the messages and uh, edit the messages and we so had when this when this ran uh, for the the cable company was there an Atari unit that ran 24 7 or did you put it on tape and then it looped the tape Yes, good question. Uh, we had an Atari. I, you know, after I wrote the program, I wasn't sure I could do this, and we used mine for a while. I would bring it back and forth home to school. But the school bought one, and uh, then we had to buy another one. And we originally bought an Atari 400 to be the one that ran the messages. So we would put them on the tape, load them into the Atari 400 with tape, and it would run 24 7. And by the way, both the Atari 800 and the 400 did that for years, running 24/7, and never, never had a problem. <laughs> it, 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 it boggled my mind the fact that that thing could go. Once we loaded it up, we we took the um, um, the disk drive off of it and hooked it up to one in the other room where we could edit the messages. Mm -hmm. So we only hooked up the drive to load the messages into the unit, that, into the uh, Atari 800 that was broadcasting. And it was fine. People in the community were just delighted with it. So you share the one drive between the 400 and the 800, and the 400 only had the drive when it needed it when you're installing new messages. Yes, and I, now this goes back, this was 1982, so it goes back quite a ways. Sure. And, uh, I, uh, I'm pretty sure we uh, put some of the messages on tape to load them into the 400. I don't know why we did that, but we did that. So what type, can money. you give me an example of the kind of, of messages that were on here? Uh, you know, I, I community yard sales, I mean, what, what sort of thing? 
Exactly. Everything that was going on in the school went on. Mm -hmm. And it was a great education for me. I was a young teacher. I was an English teacher, basically. And, uh, you know, it started teaching filmmaking and then got into this television production. But I didn't know much about community access cable or the importance of it. But people started saying, hey, they'd call us up and say, can we get a message about the Little League program? We've got sign-ups for Little League and Soccer League. And I'd say, sure, and they would fill out a form and uh, send it in. And then we found all kinds of things that people wanted up there. So it was, a, it was actually built community. Uh, I, I was really impressed with it that, uh, you know, people watched it and they liked it. School closings were the most fun. Uh, I was the first person who got the call from the police chief <laughs> saying that schools were going to close, the superintendent and myself. And I would dash over to school, you know, no matter what, you know, if I had to walk over, I, I lived not far, and I would manually program in that school was closed today at five o'clock in the morning. Just like and, a, a snow day situation? Yeah, oh yeah, snow day, yeah. So uh, things like that were, were, were really interesting because people could turn on the cable and, and they would know right away that school was closed. They'd be the first to know. Hmm. So but all, this the, was, school, I'm sorry, all the school information, club meetings, uh, games, uh, 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 everything to do with school, you know, certainly uh, the, the exam schedules and things like that. We had a steady stream of people, uh, you know, both within the district and without, wanting to get messages on. So the funny thing was, somebody approached me about Atari's um, program exchange. And I said, oh, what the heck, you know, another couple other schools were using it. And so getting it into the program exchange required a lot because they didn't understand what it was used for. I said, well, it's a, it's a message display program. It's used in television production. And a fellow on the phone from Atari said to me, yeah, well, you know, we needed to work with a joystick. We envisioned it being used by students who'd leave their mom a message on the TV saying, you know, this is where I am, mom, or something like that. Don't you think that's a great idea? I said, yeah, but it doesn't work with a joystick. We don't need to work with a joystick. He says, well, can you make it work with a joystick? <laughs> and I... I said, yes, of course I can. So we did. We, we programmed a few extra things into it for message display program on Atari Program Exchange. And there were very few programs in that category, so I got a second place prize. And at that time, it was pretty good. I got a few disk drives, I think, for my equipment. Uh, I, I must have had about $800 worth of equipment I won from Atari. Excellent. Yeah, you won the Atari Star Award second prize in home management in the summer 1982 catalog is when it was announced, which was the, the one year anniversary of uh, APX. So it's still oh, pretty young. Yeah. yeah, how about that? It was right at the beginning. Yeah. And people asked me later to port it, you know, when the IBM PC came out, they said, wow, can you write your program for the IBM PC? And I said, no, this, this took me so long and I've got plenty of work here to do. I did, and later on, of course, I regretted it. I saw many programs like mine being used commercially and sold for thousands of dollars. And so, how much did yours, your program sell for? Do you know? I think about seventeen ninety nine or something like that. <laughs> how much? Did, how many did you? How many units did you did you sell? Do you know? You know, I wish I, I I must have. I should have pulled out that file folder. I have a file folder. Part of the fun story is who I sold it to. I have letters upstairs. One from. Uh, a State Department office in Sena, which is in Yemen, huh. they were using it. A police department in Shreveport, Louisiana, used it. And I got letters from these people, you know, saying, "Oh, could it, you know, could I have more information or do this and this and this? Could I have? It, could I make it do something else?" But I kept a lot of letters. It was great fun for me because I, I never expected anybody to be really using it. Awesome. Uh, I don't know how many, but I do know I got checks from Atari. And uh, I think it wasn't too long after that that Atari ran into problems because of uh, Jack Tramiel's, or uh, when Warner bought them out, mm -hmm. uh, there was really a change of management that was just crazy. I'm sure the, the story's been recounted a number of times before. Yeah. But again, that was, uh, uh, it was a long time in the past. I don't remember much, but I was, I was pretty much disappointed because Atari was a great machine and a great company. 
I could call their offices in California and ask them questions and talk to some of the original developers and programmers. Wow. It was it was fun, and I was a you know very young guy. I uh, I, I could have been in, I was in my twenties, I think. So, um, can you tell me more about working with Atari and working with the, the people at, at APX? Uh, you, I mean, you submitted your program, you called them up, you they, I don't know. Tell me something. Tell me a story. Yes, <laughs> they called me. Uh, that they, as I say, they called me and asked me could it work with a joystick. But I think in all the conversations, I wound up shaking my head, saying. I don't know that these people know what it is, you know. For, for high schools, particularly schools like my own where you're doing everything on the fly with a limited budget, right. uh, it was great. And a lot of schools used it. I, I actually wrote an article in Compute, uh, for Compute, mm -hmm. which was published, and then one in a magazine called Educational and Industrial Television explaining what it did with actually screenshots. I took screenshot photographs black and white in the dark room, de developed them myself, sent them off, and got a nice little article published. But uh, I, I, as I say, the thing about Atari was I really loved the fact that so many people loved the Atari. And I think the, uh, the thing that might be of interest to you was PAX, the Philadelphia Area Computer Society. Mm -hmm. uh, I found other people who were using the Atari. There was a man who worked at Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey. And these guys were really, really bright. I mean, I was a tinkerer. I was no genius. But uh, a, a man named Bill Huff. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked to, we're sitting there talking, and he says, well, I got an Atari because I wanted to use the computer at work at home. And I would have to sign out one of these, um, well, what do they call them, the machine you put a handset in? and uh, A modem and a dumb, uh, acoustic modem or dumb terminal or something? Yes, it, yeah. it was really a dumb terminal, but it was a very expensive piece of equipment. He said, I figured that I could program the Atari to do that and turn the Atari into any kind of terminal. And again, this is a piece of equipment that was four and five thousand dollars, and here you are with an Atari 800 that was running about twelve hundred. Mm -hmm. Well, Bill did it, and he published his program. I, I think he sold it through APX2. But I was fascinated with how many people then started using Bill's program and other people who were in our little group of maybe 12 people who met uh, in Philadelphia. But it was a great environment. The TRS-80 people were there. The Commodore PET people were there. And, of course, Apple was just starting also. And, uh, you know, every month we'd have one main lecture in the lecture hall about computing in general. And then we'd go to our separate groups. That's what I was going to ask if, if you guys got along or was it cliquish? Yes, as a matter of fact, it, it, it was. You know, some guys could only uh, talk about their own machine, and, and I guess there would be a little cliquishness. But I guess I was always more of a generalist, and I enjoyed being there and hearing about all these things. So I wound up on the board. Hmm. I became president of the Atari group and wound up on the board of PAX. And uh, it, it, was, it was an interesting time for me because at the board meetings, you, you know, you had to discuss all kinds of things like the organization and how it would grow and, and again, how you manage so many people interested in computing, so many groups. It, we really took over one Saturday a month. We took over LaSalle College, which became LaSalle University, mm -hmm. which was my alma mater. I was a city kid and lived in the city. It was, you know, it was where I went to school. So it was, it was a, a great, you know, it's funny, the Atari was like a, a window that opened up the world to me. So it sounds like Message Display Program was your first major programming project. Yes, uh, in a, um, yes, my first and probably my only. The other thing I did that I was really proud of, and, and uh, I probably have a disc with it somewhere around, was I put together a number of, you know, there were a lot of programs in Compute Magazine that we would type in. Sure. Sometimes we'd take turns and somebody would say, well, I'll type in 100 lines of this program, you type in the 100 next, and when we meet, we'll all get together and assemble this. We typed in a lot of programs, a lot of public domain main programs out there and exchanges, and our group exchanged with other groups out in California was really big with computer societies that 
uh, we exchange newsletters, and I wrote a column every month for the Atari, uh, you know, you know, a column for the PAX newsletter. So it, you'd be contacted by somebody out in California and say, "But you were doing something educationally out here with Ataris too," and. Uh, it was great. I found more and more interest in the Atari and education. So I assembled a lot of public domain programs onto a disc and made it such a way that you could select from a menu by pressing 1 through 10. And also a little bit of instructions for the programs. A lot of these public domain educational games and little puzzle games, uh, they weren't consistent. So I had to reprogram some of those. And that disc had maybe 12 programs on it, and it wound up in the library of a lot of school districts and district resource centers around the country. And even in Ireland, oddly enough. <laughs> well, if you yeah. find it, um, send it to me or send me a copy or something. We can get it online and share it with the world. Yeah, I, as I say, I don't think it would have too much interest now, except to people with Atari 800s. But yeah, it was an Atari 800 disc, and uh, if I find it, I will. Excellent. Excellent. So message display program was written in BASIC, I assume? Yes, it was. There was one little machine language subroutine uh, to put a clock in it. Someone said, well, you know, I really would like to see the time displayed. And so I asked one of, uh, at PAX again, at our user group, one of our great programmers uh, who had programmed a few commercial programs uh, on the Atari 800, said, well, here's a little subroutine that you can use. It's, it's public domain. And it was a machine language subroutine that I put in there and had a call to it from BASIC, and it worked. I, I knew nothing about machine language, but it worked. But I got pretty good at Atari BASIC. I spent many, many, many hours. And my son also, by the way. Uh, my son is out there. He's in uh, the East Bay, and he works for um, Square, a company in, in San Francisco. And he's been a programmer all his life from those days, accompanying me to to PAX with our Atari stuff. Oh, we all awesome. cut our eye teeth on the Atari. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's cool. Um, cool. So you wrote the article for, for Compute, which was pretty much about message display programs. Is that right? Yes. It was the basic. It was a very simplified version that uh, someone could get started and then add their own bells and whistles. I think it was probably only uh, 50 lines of code. And that was in Compute. And I got some response from that, a few letters. Yeah, awesome. Um, let's see. I'll tell you something else. Uh, if while you're looking, uh, yeah. I have something here. Uh, I don't know if you can read that. The computer in the home: its challenge to education. Edited by, I can't read the names. Oh, yeah. Frank Lovis and uh, some others. Uh, this was published in 1985. Okay. And here's the, I'm going to send you a copy of this article. I tried to find a digital copy. I don't have one. I actually wrote this on the Atari 800. Oh, yeah? Can you read that? I don't know. Is that? Uh, Computer User Groups and Public Education, a Case Study by Dennis Harkins. That's it. This was published, believe it or not, in, in Amsterdam. I was invited to Switzerland to present my first big paper in education. Wow. Um, at a conference. Uh, see, I took a sabbatical. My, my relatives are Irish. They live north of Dublin. So I took a sabbatical, and I knew they were using Ataris in schools in Ireland. So I took a sabbatical, and I spent a year in, in England and Ireland. And uh, I was studying the way they did computers in education and the way they trained teachers because that was the way I was moving. I was becoming a teacher trainer. So I went to a conference and I mentioned to them about PACS. I said we had this users group in Philadelphia that was, you know, a phenomenal way that most of us learned about computing. We didn't learn about it by taking graduate courses. And so somebody said, well, you ought to write a paper about it. And when I did, I was invited to Switzerland to present the paper. Well, wow. uh, I my first paper, I got approval from the school district to go at my own expense. <laughs> I did. Wow. So I went to Switzerland, presented the paper, 
and uh, it was even reprinted as one of the uh, oh it, it, in a it composed it's a compilation of the best uh, papers of computers in education over 25 years. Wow. So it was really, and again, that was the Atari. There's a lot about the Atari group in that article, in that paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was my, my biggest claim to fame, I think, in my career. <laughs> awesome. How long did you teach? Oh, 30 years. Yeah. Are you retired now? or? Yes, yeah. I've been retired for more than 10 years. I turned 65 in a month or two. Okay. And, so uh, your, 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 your teaching career outlasted the Atari at the, uh, at the school, I assume. Oh, yes. Matter of fact, we moved into, uh, you know, the, the hard part was when Apple's came in, of course, I had to switch over to Apple. And I even wrote some basic programs for um, changing some things over from the Atari to the Apple. Mm -hmm. I, I learned a lot about data transfer and uh, see, I had done my inventory of the school district's audiovisual equipment on the Atari. Well, after a few years, I had to change it to the Apple because we were really an Apple district and we were only using the Atari in the TV studio. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote a program and uh, managed to switch it over and got it into an uh, Apple database. But it was Apple, then Macintosh, then, of course, we had PCs. And it became a really, really big job. Uh, too much for me. I think I was ready to retire when I retired. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I teach senior citizens at the university here through SeniorNet. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's... No, I've not. Oh, yeah, they've got a nice website. It's a nationwide program. When I visited my son, there, was some senior net, there were some SeniorNet classes uh, in his community, so I went to visit them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all volunteers, and we teach computing to senior citizens, oh, usually at public libraries and schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the evening. Are they on laptops or iPads or what are they using? Well, that's the thing. They're using everything now. A, a PCs in our classroom at the university, but I teach the course in tablet computing and it's, uh, it's, that's, that's what I've been doing for the past month, mostly getting ready to do workshops in tablet computing. So I had to bring myself up to speed on the Nexus 7 and the, I have an iPad by the way. Uh, my son it, it kicked me into that. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he gave me a hundred dollar gift certificate and said dad it's time to get one so I did. but uh, I, I had to learn the, the Nexus 7 and the Kindle and uh, Samsung uh, enough to work with people I find a lot of senior citizens here uh, got these things particularly at this past Christmas from their sons and daughters mm -hmm. When they got a new tablet, they said, here, mom and dad, here's the old one. We can communicate with this. We can use either FaceTime or Skype, and you can do this, this, and this. But senior citizens really have a hard time with the touch interface of the tablet. It's, it's uh, more so than you would think. So that's what I'm doing now. I spend a lot of time. It's almost full time. <laughs> <laughs> so do you still own an Atari? You know, it's a shame. Uh, my mother died a year ago in October, and they were all, I had two Atari 800s and two disk drives and numerous uh, other things, uh, a lot of joysticks and all the books. And uh, I, I couldn't bring them here to South Carolina because we didn't have enough room in the car. Mm. So I, I found a local uh, thrift shop where I was dropping some stuff off uh, my mother's. I mentioned to a young man there. I saw him playing a video game, mm -hmm. and I said, "Do you know anything about the Atari 800?" And he says, "Oh yeah, it's legendary." So we talked for a little while, and I said, "You're the one." I said, "Will you? What, what day will you be here?" And <laughs> he said, "I'll be here tomorrow." So I drove back and gave him everything. He was delighted. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I, I, if I had known there was uh, more of an interest, I, I came across your site by accident, really. Hmm. I would have held on to it and made sure that uh, you know some of the real enthusiasts got it. But I think this young man, I'm hoping he's having a good time with it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, there's there's an enthusiastic community for sure. I don't know. I don't think it's well. It is. I mean, you know, it's a small community, but we're tight knit, and there's message forums and the podcast, and uh, you know, people are. There's plenty of places to to keep playing with and learning about the the Atari machines. Um, I was going to ask you something. I forgot. 
Oh, you sent me a picture of the award, your your award from from APX. You still yes. have that? I've got it on the mantelpiece. If I if I were doing this on the iPad, I'd take you into the library and show you. Yeah, it's on the mantelpiece there. It's a uh, uh, it, it, it's it's a nice conversation piece. I can take it out and show people. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'll set you yeah. a nice plaque. So it I want I want to know more about the, the 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 gifts they sent you for for winning. You said they sent some disk drives, and I, I should follow up on that. I want to know. I want details about what, what they sent you. <laughs> yes, well, you know, it, it was a heyday of computing, and uh, it uh, APX really thought, I think Atari and APX thought at the time, that it was going to be a lot bigger than it was. So they wanted to encourage. They were very good working with user groups, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very easy to get information from them, and, and they were delighted to send you, you know, anything at all. And uh, they awarded prizes. I don't know what the first prize got, but I believe as my second prize, they gave me so much credit. I think it was probably, I'm guessing between five hundred and a thousand dollars credit uh, buying Apple equipment and software. I assume you mean Atari equipment and software. Oh, I'm. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Atari equipment and software, and so uh, right away the thing you needed was more disk drives, right? Uh, because if one went down, you were really stuck. The tape drive was uh, a bit bulky, as they all were. Uh, the, the Commodore tape drive, I don't know if it was any better, but uh, uh, my nephew was using that, and and I, he had the same problems. Uh, so the disk drive was what I needed. So I know I got at least one disk drive, and I think I got an Atari printer too. Hmm. It was a Centronic 737 with an Atari label on it, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think I got the printer too. Matter of fact, the printer was what I used to do the paper that I presented in Switzerland. I have the original here now. Wow. <laughs> I'll, I'll hold it up for you. I found the file on the original. I was looking for something I could send you. And that was printed with my Atari printer. And yeah. it's it's the paper. <laughs> so I did all my word processing, all my tests for t I was still teaching English at the time, believe it or not, and television production and photography. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a good career, Kevin. I was very lucky. Sounds like it. Yeah, because I was I was a city kid, you know. I went to school. Uh, I went to school on a scholarship for poor kids. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I was lucky to go to college at all, and then it fell into the teaching job. It was yeah. close by. Do you recall how your uh, time with Atari and APX ended? I mean, did they say, "Okay, we're not. This isn't selling anymore," or did did were you there till the end when they when they shut APX down? Or yes, I was. Yes, the, the program was still listed in the catalog when they shut it down. And I think they sent me a letter. Now, again, I probably have it in that file. I think they sent me a letter saying, hey, you know, you have the copyright to this program. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to sell it anymore. So at that point, I actually sold it privately myself. I, I uh, just put an ad somewhere in uh, probably Educational Industrial Television magazine. And on my own, I probably sold maybe 10 or 12 copies. Again, it was, it was probably the end of uh, the need for something like that. Right. Yeah. And I don't remember how many years it went, but uh, it was nice getting a little check. Sometimes it was, you know, maybe $5 or so for my royalties. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, was your biggest check, was it 100 Was it 1000 you know, just give me a, an idea. Of oh, uh, it, it might have been 30. Yeah. <laughs> that, that might have been a big check. I, <laughs> it was not a money maker. And the thing was, uh, you know, the programming, oh, I can't think of how many hours I must have spent late, late at night doing this when my son and wife were in bed. Mm -hmm. So. Awesome. Um, I think that's about it for my questions. My, my only, you keep mentioning this, this, uh, these files and things. If if you want to, I I would personally love to see this stuff, and I'm sure that the the world would would love to see some of the historical stuff. If if you want to scan it or send it to me, and I'll scan it and send it back. But like the 
the letters from Atari and the the letters from the the companies that, that used were it used, that used the program. I, I, and and especially the any floppy disks, any source code, whatever you've got, we we want it all. And uh, the, the community is very interested in that sort of thing. Oh, that's great. Well, I will look for it and see what I can come up with and uh, be in touch with you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Kevin, it's really been nice talking to you. Nice talking to you. Thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. And awesome. again, I'll be in touch. Sure. Great. I'll send you a link to this when it's out in the world. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Thanks, Dennis. Bye. Bye.